Hi. <laughs> Hi. So welcome to, I guess we're on episode three already of Books in Sight, the show where we try to give insight into books. I'm Ren. I'm Don. And today we're going to be talking about the, well, I guess it's not really the age old question, but the century old question, <laughs> not even a whole century, but since the beginning of the century old question, electronic or physical for your reading? What do we think? But before we get into that, do you were saying uh, before I started the stream that you just finished a book? Tell us about that. I present that one. I really liked it a lot. It, unusual cover because they put the title on sideways. Drive your plow over the bones of the dead. I have heard of this and I've heard nothing but good things. Yeah, this, uh, the author is, uh, this is a library copy, so I don't get to keep it. However, I liked it enough that I went to uh, Second and Charles and found this, which is another book of hers. It's, it's her, her, this is her earlier book, apparently, for which she won the Booker Prize. And um, was a runner-up for an American award of some kind. That title is from William Blake. Oh, and okay. each of the chapters has a quote from William Blake's work as an epigraph to the chapter, the 17th mm. chapter. And uh, while I was it's waiting- It's translated for, from, is it Polish? Yes, yes, translated from the Polish. Uh, the only other book she had out at the time, according to the little thing there, just says, mm -hmm. also by her flights, that other book. Mm. Since then, she won the Nobel Prize for literature and um, has this, I first ran across her because I was at the library, a book came through the back door. Mm -hmm. It's 900 and something like 61 pages, something like that. And the pages run backwards, which remains to be understood at some future mm -hmm. point. But it's it's her magnum opus, apparently, and huh. I may or may not get to that one. But anyway, that. She's really intriguing. Um, she's a really good writer. I just, while I was waiting to talk to you, I wrote a book review about it. <laughs> oh, and one last thing to mention, just yeah. real quickly. This book is a nice, either, either called trade paperback or quality mm. paperback. I actually prefer this physically to read. It just is very pleasant to the hands, you know, mm -hmm. more than hardback even. But I know that the hardback kind of has a trophy quality of, you know, like I have the recognitions by William Gaddis, but mm. I don't have a hardback copy. Um, I, if I could get one, I probably would. And then that would sit on my shelf as in a way, a stupid word, but trophy, like a indication of my admiration for the book mm. by getting the hardback, you know, something like that. Well, it has, yeah. I think hardbacks kind of have this sort of feeling of prestige, I guess is maybe the word, right? Over right. the- if you, said I, if you said I bought a um, picture, of which there are only 98 copies mm. made, that kind of thing. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Can I see it? You know. <laughs> mm. So anyway, it's, 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 I think it just is an indication if you're going to show somebody else your library that they're somewhat more important because you had to pay more to get it. You know, so it's sort of, it's, it's I don't know, it's not that important, but I could see why people do it, and I do it too. <laughs> well, and when we get into showing some copies of books, I think I, I have some mixed feelings about like in terms of the beauty of the actual covers and the design of the books. Like I think there are some paperbacks that we'll look at later that I I really like think are stunning and that the design and the cover are really great. Yeah, but point. in terms of like beautiful books, I think I tend to lean more towards the hardbacks, especially if we're talking about um, vintage books like mm -hmm. these back here yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, on that top shelf, just because I think there's, it's easier to create a more beautiful, durable, decorative look on a hardback. Or I don't know if it's actually oh, easier, cool. but I think I, that I agree. Finnegan actually collects books just for their look as a book. I remember it, him it saying seems, that. It seems silly in a way to a big <laughs> reader, but on the other hand, I enjoy looking at what he has because they are very attractive, you know, yeah. see different, uh, different bindings and appointments to the binding you know really definitely cool. as for me i'll have to go grab it but i'm also just about to finish up two different things i'm like within 10 pages of finishing one mm -hmm. and i think 25 of the other let me go grab them yeah yeah please please do so the one that i'm reading for my book club at the moment is the memory police by yoko ogawa well i saw you referred to that in goodreads yeah yes 
It's really good. I also um, won't go too much into it, but it's compared to 1984 by George Orwell, oh. which I can completely understand. But I think that for me personally, either one of them could also be misread in the exact same way. Hmm. Like, I think, you know, how I've, I've noticed a lot that, um, like, very conservative people tend to reference 1984 because they think that's like what's happening to them right now and they're being like silenced and like uh thought policed or whatever but i think that's if you read 1984 in very bad faith and i think you could read this one similarly in bad faith where if you were coming from that perspective you would read this and think that describes me and i'm like i don't think that's who this is describing but okay okay. (laughs) but it is compared fairly to 1984. Very, very cool. It's yeah. an interesting cover, too, actually. Yeah, if we're talking about covers, it's really cool. Yeah. I think it's nice that the, and interesting that the title is just right in here. Okay. And I'm almost sorry that it has the little accolade thing yeah. up here, because I feel like if it just had this, that would look like it was the accolade, and it wouldn't even look like right. it had a title on it, and I think that would have been This one has that same thing up yeah. there. Yeah. Was that a National Book Award? By yeah. Okay, yeah. that's what that stands for. Yeah, yeah, that's too bad. I guess the night. What would be nice if they would put that on where you could actually wiggle it off. You know, like just a sticker. They used to. I feel like they used to. Yeah. I don't know yeah. why they stopped doing that, but and yeah, and this one is also a finalist for the International Booker Prize as well. But the only thing, again, as a book collector, you may someday, if that's your copy, you may someday mm. run across a copy that predates winning that award or getting being a finalist. Mm-hmm. It won't have that, and then you go, ah, now I've got a fresh copy, because you're saying, out of respect for this beautiful cover, I would like to get that thing off of there. Now, for the second thing that I'm reading, I don't think it has the most beautiful cover. It's very functional cover, <laughs> but the story is really good, and that's uh, Dostoevsky's White Nights. This is like a oh. bind-up of a couple of different short works of his, but I'm working okay. on White Nights at the minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's my f- fourth in a row of his, and I... The double was my favorite, but I'm starting to think that I might like this slightly better. I think I like the double better, like, thematically, but I think that in terms of the way it's written, the White Knights is more beautiful, I think, just the actual prose of it. Yeah, Dostoevsky used to be, I used to be a read, I read a lot of his things, I have not in a while, but I've been reading some stuff about him, about his work, and you're kind of, you know, I'm feeling encouraged by your comments, maybe I'll get back to him. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm doing it in a very weird way where it's like, I'm going to just go through it chronologically. Not everything, because he wrote like a million short stories and even getting like just the actual books to cover all of that would be like kind of insane. But (laughs) I've gotten a couple of pretty decent bind ups of like multiple short stories of his. And I'm just kind of going with those for the short stories and then getting into the longer works. But yeah, there were a ton of even just like his shorter novels that I had never heard of before. Um, Not that that's the be all end of like, oh, well, if Ren didn't hear about it, it must be really obscure. But I just mean like I had never heard of um, like the next one that I'm doing is the first one that I'll do from his post incarceration period which is called uncle's dream which is another one i like again i'd never I've never even heard of that yeah, i read i've read like the four or five major mm-hmm. novels long ago all of them were very moving very deep and great mm-hmm. and i probably would enjoy reading some of this earlier work with these other works that i as i said i don't even know some of the stuff he did i story. would recommend the double i think the first one that he's considered his first big work was Poor Folk, which I also read, which was in 1846. I liked it, but I just don't like epistolary novels. So that was my thing. If you don't mind, then that one's good. But I liked the double better just because I thought it was, I don't know, it was just thematically more interesting than Poor Folk, which was very much what the title would suggest. It's like, Or folk have it rough. And I mean, he explores it in an interesting way, but it's just not that unique. Whereas the double, I thought he handled in a way that even as somebody who's read a lot of um, doppelganger fiction, specifically even that would be considered gothic doppelganger sort of motif fiction, I thought it was a unique take on it. And it was really interesting. I liked it a lot. But it does fall into that kind of stream of consciousness type. It's not quite that because it's in third person, but it feels like, that kind of fever dream pacing. Very cool. Uh, uh, 
speaking of the doppelganger thing, I, mm -hmm. uh, this is a little bit off of our point, but yeah. I, uh, Casey and I just finished watching a really interesting show. I won't go into that, but I pulled something from the library as a possible follow-up for us to pursue. Oh, yeah. Jekyll and Hyde, oh. in a, modern, a modern take set in London in the 1930s. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I, I have no idea if it's any good or not, so I'm not really tooting it, but it just, I run, you know, coincidentally, it's another doppelganger story. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I did like Jekyll and Hyde, but again, I just don't like that epistolary style. I didn't like Dracula for that reason either. I just, I don't know, yeah. for me, especially for that type of story, it just feels like it sucks some of the tension out of the, the, yeah. the story and the reading experience, especially in Dracula. I felt like that should not have been done that way if it yeah. was going to be gripping yeah no you're right um there's the secret sharer by joseph conrad mm. which is sort of that kind of a story and not epistolary so mm. <laughs> then i might like that better because <laughs> i That's liked frankenstein and that one wasn't you know it was like well it was partially that right but it that one just worked better because the it didn't matter. Like it wasn't an active plot driven story in the same way as like Dracula. Right. Right. Anyway, whatever. That's a whole other topic, but <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I guess thinking about books as physical objects, obviously that's the side of this. We both, well, obviously we both fall on. Um, yeah. Let's talk about that. <laughs> okay. well, I, what I, is, I, what is your I feeling a, about it? Yeah. Well, I have a strong go-to that I usually bring mm -hmm. up. And this subject comes up, which is, you know, yes, you can you you can look on your pad on your iPad or something to read a book, and it does have the advantage you can change the typeface, you can highlight things, you can refer back to it, as long as you're able to get it and retrieve mm -hmm. it, which is not an absolute guarantee. Um, but the difference in my mind would be like saying if you had let's say photographs of your family and loved ones and whatever in your phone you'd have to go out of your way to go, let me see if I can find a picture of grandma. Whereas if on your phone, in your house, you had it on the wall, you'd be noticing grandma here and there randomly. And it would be very nice. Having books on your shelf, I think is the equivalent. You you can, you know, like just see an old friend as it were and go, oh yeah, and have a pleasant moment. That'll never occur if it's, if it was read on a pad, there's no, there's no object to remember. Yes, you get the same words, but I think holding the book and carrying it around and reading it is part of the memory of the experience of it. And then having the residue or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, even when somebody's dead, people like to visit a graveyard. I yeah. mean, that's the difference between that and uh, cremation. I'm kind of coming up with another metaphor, but with cremation, at least they, people say, well, I'd like the ashes. Like, what is this demand for a physical thing? It's similar to the books. I want a thing that can mm -hmm. I can touch and feel and look at, browse through. I picked up my copy of uh, I was going to I was going to show the difference between Look Homeward Angel in this mm. version, and here's the one I would have originally read. Mm. Land and one of the interesting arguments could be this does not put anything in my head. Everything will mm -hmm. be up to me. That's a that's a possible argument for cover art issues. Well, yeah, I just I just flipped this book open, and um, I haven't read it in fifty something years. But I I ran across this page and I go, oh, this is really cool writing. I you know I'm re renewing my respect for him that I haven't really thought about in a long time, just by opening it up at random. Mm -hmm. You know, and you wouldn't you wouldn't say somewhere in my machine, I can grab out some book I read a long time ago and flip through it and read a thing. Nobody's ever going to do that. I completely agree with you. And actually, I was thinking about it because living in the digital age and being a digital native, whatever that means, like yeah. I do spend a lot of time reading things online. And to me, a part of what I like about books that's separate from what you're talking about is that it isn't online like I, because I spend so much of my time on the internet on my computer on my phone it's it's sort of a nice way to step away from that cyber world for a little bit and right. it's a good excuse to both live in the present even though in a book you're kind of traveling anyway you're not really like in the moment in the same way if you just sat on your 
deck and read a book or something. But yeah. it is to me a separation from the world of the internet. And I know people would say, well, you know, not all e-readers even have internet access, for example, or, you know, you can't just like go on Facebook and, or Instagram or TikTok and be distracted or whatever. still but, staring at a screen. Yeah, it just, object, you know. yeah, it doesn't feel like enough of a separation to me. And even like being on a plane, because I know that that is one of the indisputably true things about e-readers versus books is that the e-reader can contain a you know a whole library of books with one thing whereas mm -hmm. like if you're going on a plane what are you going to take five books with you like and take up all that space like I do understand that argument but still to me and this is just partially how I've curated my own travel experiences but I just have never thought of it that way because to me it's like I put a lot of thought into the one or two books that I'm going to bring with me on the trip. And again, being on the plane is an opportunity for, in my opinion, to have that separation from the screen where it's like, oh, I'm going to be on this plane for seven and a half, 10 hours. I can use this as my break from right. that world. And, right. and that's going to require that I have a physical book with me. And as well, I think it, it also makes me more thoughtful because you are only going to bring one or two so I do think about it more carefully instead of just loading the thing with anything I might read, because then you kind of get that into that situation where at least for me, it would be like paralyzed by choice, where it's like, it's, if I only have two, I'm like, am I in the mood for this or that? But if mm -hmm. the e-reader is loaded with even 10 books, I might be like, this is too much of a hassle for me to like choose something. I'll just watch a movie at this point, whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's that for me as well, yeah, yeah. that aspect. And I, I, do, I do come across very judgmentally as though how dare anybody not prefer books to screen re, screen reading? Yeah, <laughs> I think there is a digital divide, and I'm on the, you know, the downside of it or whatever. Mm. Um, I did pick up a Publishers Weekly out of the trash at the library; they threw it away, <laughs> and it had an article in there on the fact that books are still doing well in the world. Yeah, so that's a good sign. I I um, hope that future generations appreciate them. In in Star trek with picard mm. as a captain they used to show him occasionally sitting at his desk on an off time reading a book physically and then you know instead of pretending that's the way of the future he was just it, it was like a thing that he cared about and he also drank mm. you know earl gray tea or some specific kind of tea mm. so they were kind of you know just offering this thing of like there probably will continue to be people who want a book when, no matter how digital the world goes yeah and actually it's funny that you say that because um there was a book that I read for a course when I was at university called Super, it's a very silly title, but it was called Super Sad True Love Story by mm -hmm. Gary Steinhardt. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it made me never want to read anything by him ever again, because, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Gary, because it was just, it was like a dystopian novel. And it was just so cynical when it came to that sort of thing specifically in a way that just rang so not true to me. Like in the world that he develops in this book, um, one of the things is that the main character, not Gary, we'll call him, I can't remember what his name was, but him, this guy, he's like a sort of middle-aged man and he has this girlfriend who's much younger than he is. And in this world, everything is going increasingly online. He had like some special word for it kind of a thing. And um, she goes to his apartment for the first time and she's like, oh, what is that horrible smell? And it's his books. And I was Ooh. just like, I don't think. And, and there's like a whole set piece in the novel about her and like not understanding why he has these books. And it just to me felt so, I don't know if you've ever seen this meme but I think of it often when I read stuff or see stuff like this, which it, it goes like, <laughs> herb derb, technology is scary, and Thomas Edison was a witch. <laughs> and that's kind of how that struck me in that book. <laughs> Where I'm just like, okay, man, like, whatever. Like, you're making this up. It's like you created this idea in your head that young people don't like books, and then you, like, integrated that into your story as though that's based on reality instead of just right. your, I don't know, yeah weird feeling about this because I just don't see that happening. Let's not yeah. read any more books by Gary Shenanigan. <laughs> no, I, that just, I don't know. It just made me not trust him. I was just like, 
I, mm. not to harp on him too much because, you know, I'm sure people like him. I don't have it. I don't even remember anything else about that book because that bothered me so much, <laughs> but it was just like, it was just so dishonest. Like it just felt so dishonest to me. Like you didn't look into this at all. This is based on some nightmare you had in your own mind. If we're trying to get at tr truth with our fiction, there was no truth in this. Young people don't read. And in fact, the things that are so wonderful about them are the things they won't let. I don't know. But it was like in this world, um, they it, everything had to be written in the shortest form possible. So it was like about scanning, like people didn't read anymore. They scanned like that was all they did. And it was supposed to be a critique of that, of a thing that I think is a true thing with like headlines. Like people don't actually read the news article. They just read the headline and then keep going. Right. And they don't actually like investigate anything because it's easier to just get all of the information. I, think, yeah, I, say, I, I presume I got the gist and you go, yeah, well, not, not necessarily, but you think so. Yeah. So, but he was like extrapolating out of that probably true thing that like people then wouldn't want to read a novel because it wouldn't be something you could scan in a headline and that just seemed like such a stretch to me but yeah no I did not care for that book and I did not want to read anything else by him after that so. yeah I've seen that name I've never read anything by him I mean I've seen his books here and there but as far as I know from that one book I read you're not missing much <laughs> <I'll take laughs> like I think he's funny I I think that from what I remember about him he's not a comedian, but he's, it's supposed to be like witty, his books. Like it's supposed to be like biting satire and like that kind of thing. But at least on that one, it was just such a fail. And then there were other things now that I'm thinking about it in that book specifically that I just didn't yeah. think made sense. It just seemed like some kind of weird, not even moral panic based thing, but just a like, yeah, her, her technology is scary and Thomas Edison was a witch sort of way. <laughs> It does raise in my mind the question of of um, propagandizing in a book. Yeah, I really, I really think higher higher level literary books are ev even handed on matters that are re brought up in the book. Often, I mean, usually, the book I just read, the woman, the woman character is a vegetarian, mm. and she has a strong feeling about that, and sounds off about it throughout the story and the author is apparently vegetarian okay. you know and you could go you could go so there could it could be construed as you know look at a soapbox <clears throat> instead mm -hmm. of a novel you know what i mean uh, uh, gary shenanigan whatever his name is so, you know could have that element too where he's going like hey uh, in my book i will push my belief system which you could say well you're free to do that but i think i think a truly literary writer and I, I'll give this woman a pass because the book was excellent. And I, you know, and I, I would, I don't have to interpret it the way mm -hmm. I'm suggesting. But if that comes across as the main thing, then then the book is, as as Joseph Campbell would say, it's a propagandistic, you know, because he's saying, um, every, 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 going, you went back to Aristotle. I mean, we're getting off the point yeah. about the books, but in Aristotle, apparently there's, there was the idea that you can be, attracted to something with desire or repelled with fear or loathing. Mm. And in between those two, if neither of those obtain, you can have an epiphany, mm. which is you're not clawing after something or fearing it, you're experiencing purely something. And I think a good example would be Thomas Mann's Magic Mountain. Mm in which he presents two characters that are sort of vying for the soul of this kid, what like left-wing and right-wing philosophers kind of. And Mann presents both of them very strongly. Like he doesn't tilt it like, well, my opinion is this, and here's my opportunity to persuade the readers of my novel. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's saying, here are both of those points of view very thoroughly explored. So I, I think it's just an interesting point. And the book you're talking about and possibly the one I just read are walking a line. Yeah. Into, is this propagandizing or is this just part of the plot? I guess. Mm, I hesitate on that point only because I feel like it, it kind of to me, not that I, I'm, I'm sort of still working it through while we're talking about it, but the my hesitation to say like, yeah, is just because whenever I hear, for example, people say of anything, 
like, why does it have to be political? I'm like, I think everything is political to an extent. And and to the same end, I would say so are books. I think it just kind of comes down to how well it's done and how true it is. You know, like, for instance, you going back to Dostoevsky's The Double, just because it's like on my mind. Basically, my interpretation of what he's exploring in that novella is the because the protagonist is this guy who is very, very socially anxious and very, very introverted. And everything bad that happens to him is because of those traits. So basically, he's put in a lot of positions where it's really obvious that that's not a good thing to be. Like society is not set up for people to be those ways. And Mm -hmm. it's set up for people to be extroverted. It's set up for people to be able to engage with other people easily and in a very pleasant way and he just struggles with that and he ends up having a mental breakdown because of it now to me it's like well what is that what are you what is that exploring what's the propaganda part you're talking about and to my i I would say well what i got out of that was isn't that horrible like why does it have to be that way like do we have to set society up this way because there are lots of people who are like this guy and there is a horror in having to exist in that type of society if you don't fit into that personality type. And does it have to be that way or could we be accommodating for different types of people? And that to me is, that rings true because I think it's an investigation of a system, you know? That's a very good point. And it's it sounds like it's presented sort of like the novel you mentioned and 1984, the parallel one, where yeah. you're saying somebody might interpret it this other way that I don't want them to. I interpret it this way. And I'm going, in other yeah. words, it's actually potentially either one. And yeah. so the Dostoevsky one is sort of like that too, in the sense that he's presenting a picture where you can go, I'm extremely sympathetic to this guy. And it makes me think that society should be more accommodating. And somebody else could read it and go, you know, I, I like to refer to that book as a good example of what's wrong with being like that. Yeah, you know I mean? exactly. But, but I'm sort of defending this yeah. an ended thing. And yet it doesn't mean that the reader can't side with something or recognize that, that a description has been presented that they appreciate yeah. going, I couldn't have said it any better. That's a really good thing. If you read it with my thought in mind, I think you will appreciate this, you know. That, yeah. And not only really that, but also, like, I think, and you've done a way more, like, literary studies type of courses over your life than I have. But what I always took away from those is it's, like, in a, what separates, like, a good book from a bad book, although Oscar Wilde would say they're, <laughs> it's either well-written or poorly written, that's it, it's not good or bad. But, like, um it is the idea that there is a thought process that goes into the symbolism, into the themes. And to me, like if you're going into themes and symbolism, that's already taking a side on something. Like you're saying something. It's not really neutral, right? Like I, th- that's just my feeling about it. Well, that's, a very, that's, a, that's a really interesting point. I, I am I am kind of trapped in the thoughts that you're presenting in, in a book I just picked up, a friend of mine at work, said, you want this book? And I go, yeah, that looks interesting. It's about James Joyce mm. and history. Mm. And the author, the author is arguing right from the beginning, even, and, he, and he, he's aware that he's going to be subject to this too, which is, it's going to, everything requires interpretation. Like I said, there, when you look at history and you go, oh yeah, the Mayflower came over and blah, blah, blah. And I go, what makes you think you know the story about that? Oh, well, I was taught in school and I I, I actually read a book about something. And you go, well, did you read this other guy's book? And you go, oh, shit. Now there's somebody who's going, taking a completely different view. Or, you know, um, I think you're in your generation, maybe more than anybody else's, or maybe the hippies kind of got there too, which is, I think we were given a load of goods by our teachers on how the, you know, Indian giving, you know, and the Mayflower thing of like, they made a deal and how can they object to... They just sold Manhattan Island or whatever. All this stuff that you can reinterpret and go, no, history has given us a, bo- you know, historians or teachers have given us a bogus view of this thing. And the, the, the book that I'm reading now, and he's citing lots of historians over centuries, is say, saying that the, the latest insight is 
everybody you can either has an ax to grind or has unconscious biases you know and the guy's going to go and that's going to include me too but what i want to do in this book is explore the ones that james joyce might have had mm-hmm. even at the same time that joyce is exploding false notions of history he's still still succumbing to something else so we're, so in that sense if that's true we're never going to really escape that which is the personal bias of you know nobody is truly absolutely objective i mean i guess even modern physics has shown that that doesn't work out very well yeah no it's 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 almost like things are not simple <laughs> yeah yeah we're we're always asserting trying to assert a simple either or choice mm. but the more it's explored the more it turns out it's not just this or that it's this or that or the other thing or maybe yeah. none of those and you know whatever now what i will agree with you with though and i think to me um when i think of and i, I think this would be a good like complete topic for a podcast actually it would be like where do you draw the line between literary fiction and non-literary fiction but i would say in a nutshell because it's directly related to what you just said for me, where I draw that line is how conscious do I think the author was and how purposeful do I think they were when it came to what are you saying with this piece of work? Because very often I'll read things that I think fairly fall into non-literary fiction where the message that you, the the inevitable takeaway of the messaging from the book is so cockeyed that I just can't believe that was intentional. I don't know if you would agree with this, but let's say a book simply very strongly affirms the standard view that we already know about. Yes. You know, uh, it's one of those two go, things. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Because in that case, the person is saying, I'm writing right out of today's newspaper or something. You know, mm-hmm. And the newspaper has its own bias in the first place mm-hmm. of what's considered news. You know, in the, You know what I mean? But somebody, any writer, I mean, let's say somebody like Tom Wolfe, Tom Wolfe, the modern mm-hmm. one, it seems like his ability was to, you know, have a kind of his finger on the pulse of what's going on in our society that's, mm-hmm. you know, a, a thing. And then I'll I'll create a novel around that. You know, it's like, it, it, which is sort of like being a semi-sociologist, psychologist writing a novel, you know, yeah. and you'd go, if you, did, if you did a really great version, the, the culture grabs a hold of that book and acts as though, yep, that's got it. That's what's going on, you know. And then it becomes part of this presumption of the society, whether it's missing all kinds of other facts and important things or not. Just like the newspaper, you'd go, yeah. that's the news of the day. What about this? What about that? What about this other thing? And they're going, oh, that's just you. You're preoccupied. And I'm going, there is no actual answer yeah. of what should be in the newspaper. No, it's, it's you know, we, we all have to, to kind of. Yeah, it's just you have to filter in through like what is interesting to you and kind of maybe even why and diversifying within that. And then within that, getting a broader perspective and an in-depth understanding of whatever the topic is you're interested in. I completely agree. And I think that that's both, as you say, like nonfiction or media and fiction as well. I mean, I know for myself, I have read and read a lot of um queer literary fiction and just queer novels and I have an entire bottom row of my shelf that's just um novels that were written by people who identified as queer throughout history and around the world and that's just something that I'm interested in so I've read a lot of those types of things but then somebody else could equally say well I don't think that's very important I think that some other identity is more important to know about and then maybe they read a lot of that stuff and would then have more knowledge than I would on that but But yeah I would certainly say that anybody who does what you're doing or picks out a different one of some consequence Mm. like that is doing some is doing some extra work that the that the ordinary person going into a bookstore or whatever and saying, "What's the latest hot thing?" Mm-hmm. I'll read that. They're just wallowing, if that's not an unfair word, in the current standard. Mm-hmm. And you're saying, "I think there's more going on than that." I'm exploring what's left out of that picture, you know. And yeah. I think that's in, more intriguing. Not to say let's turn everything upside down and make queer literature the dominant thing. Yeah. 
but it but it's like saying I I I don't want to be um I don't want to succumb to I, I just keep struggling for a good word to synopsize it, but it's like the the like, status quo. Like like I guess you say received wisdom of our culture. Mm -hmm. Like you know, like if somebody goes, Oh, that guy's poor. Well, he's just not working hard enough. You go, Oh yeah, that's right out of Benjamin Franklin and you know mm -hmm. uh, these all these various self help books or something of how you should behave to get where you're going. And and I think um I don't know, that just Well, I think what we're kind of hitting on is this idea that like it is whether it's trying to be or not, I think a lot of literature or even just fiction is philosophical. Like just as I think there is nothing apolitical that you can possibly get from any type of news media, I think it's political no matter what it's about, it doesn't matter. There's always gonna be some kind of slant. And like same with fiction, I think there's always gonna be a slant and I think there's always going to be a point of view. And I think what you're kind of saying, if I'm correct, is that some of that is going to adhere to the status quo and the received wisdom, like you said, and some of it is gonna push back against it or it's going to present some alternative view. Now, I personally think either one of those could be valid or either one of those could be so, not biased, but like so emotional that it lacks any kind of introspection. And I think that that just could be in either direction. Like, I'm not the kind of person who would say, oh, this was written by some person with a marginalized identity. Therefore, it's going to be inherently better than something written by somebody who's not. I wouldn't say that because right. it could not be. It could still lack introspection. But I think that having a wide variety of choices is going to give you a better chance at finding the ones that are good and offer you a wider perspective. Yeah, it's funny you say that because it, 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 it's almost like a parallel issue to when I was a kid, there would be, mm. let's say, three major TV channels. They would all have the news at 11 and they would pretty much all have the same stories. Mm. And then you go now and now in your world, it's like with the Internet and, and podcasting and all that kind of stuff. There's a there's a, you know, superficially saying infinite. You know, there's a, a zillion or, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of options of where you quote get your news mm -hmm. but that has created a kind of chaos in in our and i'm not saying it's bad i think yeah. it's just it, we're in a necessary condition of what that has resulted in which is a bit of chaos where people are going did you hear blah 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 about about sharks being murdered off the coast of hawaii yeah. and you're going i have no idea what you're talking about i'm pretty i'm occupied with this and you know i'm, I'm following these other things and in the past, people would be guided by the simple be, being told what the news was by these mm -hmm. honored talking head men on the news at 11 o'clock who were always, you know, famous people who lasted a long time. You know, I, I think that we're way better served now as far as not being trapped in a narrative that's, you know, really narrowed by yeah. these controlling factors. But we, but, but we're, where it's also like chaos, you know, so it's, it's like saying if there were no speed limit, some people would get to where they're going a whole lot faster. And I go, there'd probably be a whole lot more accidents or be all these other things going on. Yeah. And I think that we'll eventually probably see where the dust settles, but it is definitely something that I think nobody really saw coming. I mean, we no. still see going back to books specifically. I mean, you see so many books that come out but then are immediately outdated but they're all investigating you know what is the effect of this thing that we've created on us yeah. what is that doing to us how is it changing how we interact with the world and with each other and i mean yeah I, and i think that the thing with like i look in the books being published and mm. there's a tremendous tremendous percentage of them that are foreign to mm -hmm. usa like just looking at the names of the authors mm -hmm. i mean I, I ran across one the other day that was kind of surprising. It was like so-and-so born in Idaho or something, but raised mm -hmm. in Ghana and somewhere mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, whoa, that's kind of an unusual background. At any rate, the, my point, I guess, is that it can't be bad that we're being exposed to cultures from around the world. The only I don't know, downside, if you want to call it that, is the chaos of nobody knows, you know, how the dust is going to settle is whatever phrase you just use yeah of, of of the 
chaos of this. I mean, in my mind, way off the subject of our topic here, world government mm -hmm. would be the next step, not meaning crack down and control everything, but to just give up the privacy of, I'm an American, I have certain rights. So those people over there are crazy and stupid yeah. and whatever, you know, just go, we're all just earthlings and we're, and, and everything's fine. And we're, we're, we're discovering the potential of that with all these books and learning about other, other people, but it's incredibly disruptive of the, what had been the status quo. I'm fine with it, but I'm not in a position to be helpful or hurtful really about it too much. Yeah, well, I mean, but I, I, I think that that, though, does raise a good point when it comes to to books and having them be physical, because I think in a way, because I 100 percent agree with you that I, I think the chaos is good and necessary and it just is where we are. And I don't think it doesn't scare me, I guess. Aspects of it scare me. Yeah. Um, but, but I think the overall um, consequences of having a more globalized world through the internet and the world being more borderless through the internet and having yeah, yeah. more access to different sources of information, I think in principle is a really good thing. But as you say, I mean, if nobody is on the same page of what's important that's happening, mm -hmm. then you are inevitably going to run across like conversations with people where one person knows a lot and is very well educated on one thing that's like in the news in the in their mind like sharks off the coast of Hawaii or whatever and then some they're going to talk to somebody else whose passion project is like what's going on with transgender youth in the in America and those two right. people are going to end up talking past each other because in a way because it's like oh I heard something about the sharks in Hawaii or I heard something about this transit but you don't know even what the thing you heard was because you probably right. did just read a headline and whatever right. headline that happened to be is going to shape whatever very surface level understanding of that thing you have is. And it's going to make you, I think, probably more likely to be resistant to listening to the person who maybe knows more than you, just or who at least was paying attention to this more than you, because you're like, yeah, but I can't verify that easily because I'd have to back do all the work that you already claim to have done. And it's just, it's it's a little bit messy, I agree. Yeah, who, who cares about the sharks when this is going on? And the other person goes, who cares about that when the sharks are being yeah. killed? Uh, I was going to say too, that, I, that the, um, the chaotic element that I'm focusing on a bit mm -hmm. of, of tremendous amounts of information coming at you from all points of, of the compass mm -hmm. and people bringing up things that are important to them and you going, I don't even know what you're talking about, blah, blah, blah. All of that, I, you know, I think has fed things like gun violence. I think the people are yeah. freaking out about, I don't recognize the world anymore. I don't recognize where things are going or whatever. Um, or my place in it. Right, right, and and it and it's largely just because we're in an incredibly privileged part of the planet, and so we're we're free to preoccupy ourselves with what the hell I'm going to get a gun. Ah. Yeah. Whereas people in another part of the world are like, I need I need to figure out how to get fed feed my family today. I'm not going to go attack somebody over there unless it's to get their food. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not yeah. going to be I'm going to go to a school and kill a bunch of people. Absolutely. Well, and, and I mean, bringing it back to books specifically and how that contrasts, again, to me, part of the beauty of having physical books is in contrast to all of that chaos is that it is a much more static thing. It's not just going to disappear when you scroll up and get out, go out of what your mind, but right. also be, by its very nature, by the fact that you can't just search for the keyword to get to a certain page, you have to bookmark it or remember it in some other way you're spending right. more time with the ideas that you're engaging with and i think that that in and of itself is very helpful for developing critical thinking skills just the amount of time you yeah. spend on it and I, I say this partially from my perspective as a language teacher because i say the same thing to my students it's like they have this idea that the way language learning works is they want to almost to use a class like a USB drive that they're plugging into their brain mm -hmm. to get the information. And it's like, no, you want to develop very quickly because that's the world that we live in that has this very fast paced expectation mm -hmm. of development. But 
the fact of the matter is if you try to learn 20 things at one time, none of it's going to stick very well. You have mm -hmm. to pick what's important and spend a lot of time with it. And then it's right. more likely that you'll remember it'll be in your active vocabulary. Right. That's just it's, the way it goes. Right. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a world, uh, it's a issue similar to like learning how to dance or how to do an yeah. exercise, exercising to develop muscularity. Mm -hmm. You don't just go like, I'm just going to exercise the shit out. And then by tomorrow, I'll be, some, you know, no, tomorrow you'll be exhausted. You have to have a program of how to do this yeah. and develop in the proper order and in proper amounts and all that stuff of whatever it is, you know. Yeah. And I, I think that books, by being non but when they're non digital, um, force you to slow down. Because I know that a lot of the, and we've probably heard the same arguments. I know your brother um, is very much a big advocate for e-readers and things like that. And I completely understand the arguments and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think to contradict the pros of those things. They're small. They take up very little space. It's very easy to mark things and then erase it. If you change your mind to search within the text for certain sentences, if you forgot to bookmark it, like there are a million of these types of things that I, I completely would you know, say, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. But none of those things are getting you to slow down. They're actually mm -hmm. helping you speed up this, right. this process. And to me that I don't think is always a good thing. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. Isn't there, isn't there a thing where people can have the text move? Like Finnegan does that yeah. I think with, with music where yeah. you get it set at a certain pace and it's moving mm -hmm. under your eyes. Which yeah. means if you're distracted for a moment, you go, oh, hell, I'm not going to worry about what I just missed. I'll just keep going. Whereas with a book, you just immediately look back to where you drifted off and you read it again. Which certainly happens. I mean, it's been known to happen that you sort of accidentally skim a paragraph waiting to yeah, get to but I'm saying, I'm saying with a yeah. book, it, it, you almost automatically go, wait, I, I think I yeah. lost my track of what's going on. And you just pick it up with your eye. Yeah. Whereas the other way, you'd go, oh, it's already moved off the page. I'm just going to let it go, you know. Yeah, definitely. Like I mean, with, yeah, with an audio book, they have those things where it's like, I kind of was worried about the traffic and I missed this. Oh, I have to go back three minutes. Yeah. And then listen to that stuff over again. And, oh, that, that nothing important happened. I'll just go ahead. You know what I mean? It's like you wouldn't do that in a book, usually consciously. You know? Something actually that I've heard about audio books, which this, I, I guess it sort of fits into what I'm saying. And it sounds like you're agreeing about the pacing issue, but like, this really shocked me. It's been a while since I've heard about a, something that feels like, oh, this is like what younger people are doing type of thing that surprised me, but I guess I'm getting up there. So, and I, I just, I absolutely, I can understand it, but I just would never be able to do this, I think, because I would just not see the point. I'm, I'm gleaning that it's becoming increasingly common for people not only to be listening to audiobooks, which I don't have as much of a problem with, I think it's a different experience, but I just don't find it as comparable to the e-reader physical book comparison, just because it's a different right. medium. But right. people will listen to audiobooks sped up. Oh, wow. Like they'll listen to the whole thing on like 1.5 speed. And I don't under, I, that is, well. That is, that is very weird. Yeah. I, I, my, my thinking. I get it because it's like, if the point that you're trying to achieve with this is to get through it, yeah. okay? Like if this is something you have to read for school or something and you're not really interested in it, but it, it's something you have to do, but okay. But like, that just, to me, the only justification I can think of it is if you find whatever you're listening to, to be a chore yeah. Yeah. in some way. But people yeah. will do it for things and they'll say like, oh yeah, I really enjoyed it. I tried just as an experiment to listen to something sped up by 1.5. And it was, first of all, it didn't sound quite right because it's like sped up, right? right and right. also, nice yeah, but also I was just e even more so than I think I would usually have with an audiobook. I was like having trouble keeping the thread of what was happening, which yeah. again, I guess you could develop the skill to be able to do that and not lose the thread. But I was, it just, I was like, if this is the direction people want to go with audiobooks, it makes me less inclined to listen to audiobooks because very I weird. just can't. I mean, that's very, very strange that people would do that. But I, in a way, it's a, a little, I mean, if the thing is like, I got through six books last week, or I mean, yeah. if that's their motive is sort of like, oh, look at me, look at me. That's what I mean, though, is it's like. That's true. Yeah. It, it, makes, it makes me think of this other thing that has to do with physical books, which is, mm. which is if you look at a James Patterson novel, who mm. is the number one best-selling person. 
Um, the spacing of the lines and the number of lines on a page is really weird. It's very, it's, it's about the same as a large print book, mm -hmm. but it's not a large print book. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is a technicality that I, most people would never probably be exploring, but my presumption is two things. One, they can take a book that's really not a full length novel truly correctly and make it look like a full length novel because it has that many pages, mm -hmm. even though there's not as much stuff on a page, you know what I mean? And then there, so there's so there's that's one thing where you'd go, yes, of course it's 2895. Look, it's a full length novel. But the buyer can also breeze through it like it's a novella mm -hmm. instead of a novel and feel like there, finish that one, you know. So there's sort of this double stupidity going on. You're paying more than it's worth as far as the amount of stuff you're getting. Yeah. They could have two of these in the same book or whatever. Uh, and the illusion that it's like, wow, I really sped through that one. You'd go, it's because of the spacing on the page and the number of lines they put on the page. Anyway, that's a technicality, but it just it just seems wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can kind of, I kind of know what you mean. I was actually going to comment on it in the opposite direction because that's where I thought you were going. And then you went in the complete opposite direction of what I was going, what I was thinking about it. Because I was going to say one of my, I will admit, one of my irritations with physical books is that you do have to take into consideration that sort of thing. Like what is the spacing on the page and and the, the size of the font? Because mm -hmm. I will say, especially like older Penguin classics, ooh, they really pack it in there. So mm -hmm. like if you're reading like Brothers Karamazov or something, the font is like this big yeah. and there's no spacing between the lines basically. Yeah. So if you were going to annotate, it would not be with that copy. So I will say that like there are some odd physical book printing and publishing decisions that have traditionally been made that I do not stand behind. Yeah. Um, but I do think that those are, it, it, to me, it's also kind of part of the fun though. And, and I guess this kind of bleeds into like book collecting a little bit, but like to me, for instance, with, um, let, I'll just use the Brothers Karamazov as an example. So, because I actually do have this old Penguin edition. Let me let me go grab it, actually. Hang on, because then I can show them side by side to see what I'm talking about. So, these aren't my favorite covers, but every time I see the old Penguin classics, I do get them just because, I don't know, I have the urge. But, like, they actually broke it in half because it's such okay. a long book. Okay. But if you actually look at the margins on the page, it's tiny. Yeah, yeah. Pretty dense. I'm like... Oh my God, I would not be able to annotate this. Yeah. Well, do you tend to annotate your books like in the book itself? Bakov did that. You, I, you, can I, get, you can get, you can get uh, his lectures and they'll show like a picture of his copy and it'll have like underlining and comments in the margin and all that, you know. I've de used to developed do doing that. Yeah, I, I didn't used to and I've started doing it more. Um, I guess, I don't know. I kind of had to get over the hump of like, writing in a book <gasps> just figuring this yeah i don't know well, but it, actually that's another cool reason of like somebody yeah. could say Mike could say well i could i could underline stuff you go yeah but in if you're if it's your own copy you could actually write in the on the page mm -hmm. like the Bokov did or like you might mm -hmm. be doing. uh and that again means why you would want to keep that copy because that's yeah. your annotated copy yeah well i was gonna say so like this margin isn't very good either, but I might have, now that I'm looking at this, maybe I wouldn't. But like, I got this copy of the Brothers Karamazov because I'm eventually going to get to this. And okay. it was like, I didn't care for the cover as much. I didn't care for the edition as much. I was just like, whatever, what is this Bantam? Oh, that's crazy. I usually like Bantam. Anyway, whatever. But like, I just was like, these, because they're like older Penguin editions and mm -hmm. their margins are so small anyway, I probably wouldn't write in these. And therefore I probably wouldn't use this as my like reading copy. But like this one- different you know, translators too. Right? <laughs> well, that gets into the translator issue of course as well. But like, um, but like the margins on this actually realize aren't that much bigger, but- Yeah. yeah. But again, it's such a newer the copy- of, between The lines looked a little bigger on that yeah, one. Yeah, a little bit. But anyway, but regardless, it's just sort of like, oh, this, I might have two copies of the same thing. If like one of them is like, like this one, I would not 
care about writing in or carrying around and getting beat up a little bit if it was like the one I was reading. And I might not ever actually read it. But you in just enjoy them as objects. Yeah, I'm just like, oh, this is like the ones that I put on my shelf because I have like, whenever I see, like I said, the older Penguin editions, I just kind of buy them. And yeah, yeah. I have a lot of them now. And I would keep yeah. it for that reason, just as a collector thing. Yeah. Not that they're valuable or something, but I just... It's just a thing I do. Actually, now that I think about it, it's something I didn't think to bring into this. I have a collection upstairs mm. of mystery novels mm. by authors I liked when I was really into mysteries. Multiple copies of the same books because of the difference of covers. Mm. You know, like I've got it, maybe I'll have five copies of the same book, different publishers and different covers, just as a weird collection I made. They're upstairs in a in that glass case bookcase. Oh, yeah. And I totally forgot about it till just now, but that, but that's um, like a hobby thing at the time. I don't, yeah. I don't know that I would do that now, but I have the same, you know, certain, certain publishers do appeal to me largely, largely it's the feel of the book. Like I really, mm. this is really pleasant to me. Some mm. of them are stiffer than this and they're not as pleasant. And, you know, and as you just said, like the amount of space, like this is really, mm -hmm. seems like a pleasant yeah. amount of space going on there. That, that's an interesting issue. Well, I, to push that a little bit further, because you mentioned you have some publishers you like better. Are th what, like which ones? Like I, I have feelings about this too. Uh, Penguin is a good example. Actually, you know what? There's another older publisher named Pelican. Oh yeah, that's great. You see these? Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is a two-volume thing of the Greek myths of Robert Graves. Mm -hmm. but this is, I think, it is the same company. Mm. Yeah, it's Penguin Books, but this, these were. Pelican books, if you can see that. Yeah. But, there he is. Um there's kind of those are kind of cool, but they're for the same reason that you're that you like this. There's another one of those. Gods, Gods and Myths of Northern Europe, a mm. Pelican original, but it's published by Penguin. Mm -hmm. They're in color, but they're very tasteful. I guess I don't even I guess I haven't even thought about it as I would always buy that particular mm -hmm. company. It's just in a given book if I have the choice. I, I would go by the feel of the book. Mm -hmm. And I, I really should be able to dredge it up by publisher, but I can't really think of it that way. Well, I could go through mine and it might jog your memory because like I've realized, and for me, it also depends on the age of the book a little bit um, in terms of the look. Cause like this mm -hmm. one's also Penguin, okay. but because it's not the older looking kind and they've got the colors on the top to denote right, like what right, the designation right. is or whatever. Right. I don't like it as much. And the I also find too, is this the, is a bad example because I actually don't like these covers, but I, I usually <laughs> like the older penguin covers yeah. and not the newer ones. I just feel like the newer ones, they just kind of put something on it. Like, I don't know. The, the companies are are, are getting uh, gobbled up by each other anyway. Like, yeah, you know, I know. That was a big thing. This one, whoops, here it is. Gravity's Rainbow, mm. this particular copy is Viking mm. Compass. Compass was a division of Viking. But okay. then I think Penguin bought Viking, although then they were they used the phrase Viking Penguin just because it sounded better, but I think the Penguin actually bought him, I think. Mm -hmm. and there was a recent deal that didn't go through that Penguin Viking was going to buy Random House or something, and uh, that didn't happen. I heard about that because if this is, it must be the same case we're talking about because it was really recent that Stephen King actually gave not testimony, but like he yeah. spoke at the legal proceedings for that deal against it and yeah. talking about how that would be terrible for authors. Yeah. So that because was interesting. It, if it becomes too monopolistic, then yeah. uh, there's too much control at the top. Mm -hmm. I think that was his point. I didn't follow the story very closely. See, there's an example. I saw that headline. I saw that he spoke at that and I saw some of the quotes yeah. of things that he said. I think I think that but must have been the same issue. Um it must be. Because it was it was it was exactly what you're talking about, like two very big publishing houses that were gonna merge. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah, that's, that's scary. I read somewhere not long ago, I I forget there's a German publishing company whose name mm -hmm. I can't even remember now. I think we I was gonna bring this up at a, a, an earlier meeting we had, I probably have notes on it somewhere, but mm. there's a German company whose name I can't think of that actually has a controlling interest in, is the largest single owner of publishing in general. I hope they're still watching out for monop monopolistic practices because 
that's starting to happen more and more. The giant yeah. companies are gobbling each other up. You know, yeah, we're, we're in danger of that all the time from mm -hmm. all kinds of companies where they're just merging and controlling each other, and you know, crossing lines like an oil company mm -hmm. that owns a entertainment in industry mm -hmm. thing, and you know, it's like they're octopi. Yeah, uh, well, it's one of those things that I think with publishing specifically. I mean, publishing is just as an industry held in such high esteem and has such high prestige yeah, that I yeah. think, unfortunately, it kind of gets overlooked in these discussions it, until something like that happens because people think, oh, well, it's publishing that has, there's integrity in publishing, there's integrity in these businesses. And they kind of, and I, I'm guilty of this too. There's sort of this forgetfulness of like, no, this is still a business. Right. It's Actually, not it, just. Was, I, I think there was a time when that was more, um respected for that mm -hmm. for example harcourt brace mm -hmm. I, I remember reading about this somewhere harcourt brace um makes pump makes um textbooks and stuff and so they make their money primarily from you know college mm -hmm. bookstores all that kind of thing uh and the their literary output like t.s Eliot and mm -hmm. emily dickinson or whatever they were publishing is a prestige thing like they're their purpose is to to get a pat on the back for the cultural involvement. You know what I mean? Like, look at these nice things we're doing. Yeah, we're trying to rake in the money over here, but we're willing to lose money and put mm -hmm. out a really nice edition of this famous author. You know, that kind of thing. I would see myself as a beneficiary going, yeah, I want to get T.S. Eliot's work. Harcourt Grace publishes it. They wouldn't, if there weren't a certain amount of prestige attached, and meanwhile, they're making money hand over fist by charging college students fifty dollars for their math book or something. Oh, fifty dollars! That's very two thousand of you. <laughs> Try one hundred and fifty. <laughs> yeah. So, so as like they could afford to do this, but it was yeah. it's sort of that just like really super wealthy people who buy artwork mm -hmm. just to have it. Like, yes, that cost me ten million dollars. See that picture on the wall over there? Like they might not really even give a shit, except they think I should do this to look cool. Oh, yeah. And I mean, like, <laughs> what do they say? There's no ethical consumption under capitalism. And as we both admitted, we do collect these things. So, I mean, we do play into it. But I at least like to think that when we do it, it's things that we actually like. <laughs> at yeah, least yeah. this. I, I get a lot of mine secondhand, too. I yeah, to me do. too. Like this is this looks like it's in fantastic shape. Mm -hmm. slightly yellowing mm -hmm. and it was supposed to be $17 I got it for $3.98 yeah and that's that's kind of how I in a sense sort of exonerate myself from having to follow these things super closely because I'm like well I'm not generally almost ever really I can't actually remember the last time I bought a brand new book yeah ever I, I'm sure I have but it's not not mostly um, because even if I'm buying a specific book, I would get it off of Thrift Books or Better World Books. I mm -hmm. still try to avoid Amazon when I can, because that's something I do have enough awareness about that I would say picking my battles. If I could not buy it on Amazon, I won't. Mm -hmm. Um, although I know Thrift Books has a deal with them, so it's not even like it's independent completely. Better World Books does not, though. That is completely not on Amazon. So they're they're, but, they're they're standing on they're they're holding the line. We're not going to succumb to the Amazon lure. So far, so good. But even within that, it's just sort of like, I, I still have the awareness. I think any conscious person with any sort of introspection would recognize that it's like, we still do buy into it just in in ways that make us feel comfortable. <laughs> you could say, well, if you really wanted to live by the principles you claim to espouse, you should be living in a mountain and yeah. you know growing your own food and you know whatever. You go, well, I'm not going to go that far. We all do the best we can. <laughs> <laughs> but if you did, I, I think I can still imagine in your in your hut in the middle of the woods, you'd still have wall to wall books. That would be your insulation. <laughs> yep, I, I, I feel like I would. So as we're winding down and talking about our consumerism, that is very okay <laughs> because it's fun. it's consumerism, but like with introspection, fun you recognize. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's see some pretty books. What do you got? Okay. Well, I got uh, this is this is more for the contents. Uh -huh. the Chambers English Dictionary. Mm. 
It's my favorite go-to. I have the OED in the tiny print mm. upstairs. And I think I have one supplement to it, but I have not kept up with all the supplements. But this one, I just really enjoy. I, I think Judy did not agree with me for some mm. reason, but for me, uh, I can always find what I'm looking for in here and find unexpected treasures at the same time. So I really, I really like this. Mm. Anything else? Let's see. I think I've, I don't know if I showed you this before on the, on another occasion. Maybe not. The Demons. Oh. A two volume set. It's kind of, you know, kind of weird looking. It's from, this is uh, Knopf. I mm -hmm. believe that's how it's pronounced. Um, two volumes. It's like a 2,000 page novel or something. Jaimito Van Doderer, who just had, I think they just translated something of his. And you were saying you don't buy anything new. Like I'm kind of. Yeah. Tempted. Although I have several of his books. I've read them all a long time ago, so I could easily just read the same ones over again. Mm -hmm. So I might I, I might get into him again soon. He's he's an Austrian novelist, I believe. Five times nominated for the Nobel Prize, never got it, and therefore nobody's ever heard of him. Okay. I meet you on Doderer. And what have you got? Um, so I separated mine into two categories. So just really quickly, lightning around, I'll just talk about my basically three collections of things that I have. Um, one of them is like a new idea that I happened to already have two, four, <laughs> um, which was my new thought is every time I go to a new country that has a different language, I want to try to find a copy of the picture of Dorian Gray in the local language. Oh, wow. And to that, just because I think it'd be fun. And so like, obviously I have a, a few different English language copies. I also have this German language one which is okay. this book, oh, which if we're talking about books as objects, I was given this by a friend of mine in Germany and oh, like she okay. it for me. Okay. The cover looks sort of yeah. stiffer than a typical, uh, it's a hardback, I guess, is it? It is a hardback. Every time I see it and I know what it is, it's on my shelf with all of my picture of Dorian Gray and Oscar Wilde stuff. But every time I see it, I still think, is that the little prince? I don't know why, that just makes <laughs> well, me yeah, think the it's character the character in the front. Also it has rounded corners, which yeah. is interesting. Yeah, this is a Fisher Taschen Bibliothek book. Okay. So it's like a pocket book size. Well, that's a cool idea, though, for a collection. Yeah, so I have that one, and then I you have this. You could actually read that one, probably. One. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's why, wow, well, the Russian version? Uh-huh. Yeah. Huh. So those are the two that I have, plus a bunch of English language ones. But since I'm going to, uh, to Thailand this year, I'm going to try to get it in Thai also. Okay, you might you might have a bookstore visit when if you go to South Africa too. Yes, I want to see. I felt like it's famous enough they might have it in Afrikaans, but I haven't dug into that, so I don't know. But if they do, that would be the one I would get for sure. <laughs> so that's one of my collections, and then the other two collections that I have. One of them is like more of just like a book hunt challenge thing, and the other one's actually a collection. As you know, I collect the Goosebumps books, the original ones. And I finally got the last two in the original 62 book run. Wow. And I was so proud of myself because um, this one especially is actually, I found it really challenging to find when it doesn't cost like a hundred plus dollars. Whoa. Yeah. I got it, I think for 15. And I was very proud of that. Oh, and then so this one was the last 62. Are they here or are they with you? Both. <laughs> Between okay. your house and my apartment here, I have all of them. Okay. Um, but yeah, I finally completed that. So I was really proud of that. And then the other one is more of just, and I wonder if you, I was going to ask if you do this too, but for me, it's like a little book buying challenge. It's like a little hunt because it's like a little bit hard and I don't need the thing necessarily, but it's just fun to look for. And I do like this series, which is the 1001 Nights um, Manhua okay. series. Okay. And there are 11 of them. And I finally got the first eight, but they're also really hard to find even online shopping. Oh. And they're really expensive when you do. So I'm like slowly chipping away at getting this entire series. And I have, yeah, the first eight. One okay. of them is at your place as well. Oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, those are my collections. Yeah. Your turn. Okay. Um, let's see. Here's your old friend of yours. Ooh, man, yeah. I German do like Mies 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 Mies. Yes, Yeah, Saman Yeah, I was just pleased because 
I don't know if these are available anymore, but I've got I've got the first two. I think I, mm. I might even have three. I think there might have been three, and then another bit was published. Mm. I either have two or three of these. I, I wound up with the hardbacks. I'm not sure if they're even from the same publisher. This is Coward McCann, which doesn't even exist anymore. That's a fun thing, just in the publishing history of publishers that aren't around anymore. Mm. Have a book from them. That's kind of cool. Um, another book, I think, I would really recommend. I think almost anybody would find this interesting. This is Tobias Kennedy wrote one novel and he wound up with the Nobel Prize. Mm. And, and you just uh, like that cover on it? Um, no, it isn't the cover so much. Mm -hmm. um, I just like this book. Uh, <laughs> okay. And again, it was like I read it as a paperback. Mm. And then when I ran across the hardback, I bought it. And it's got that sort of stupid trophy quality. Of like, it just shows that I think it's a really good book. You find a winner's night a traveler. I mean, again, these are not. Okay, well, here's one. It's interesting. St. Petersburg, a Russian novel by Andre Bailey. Mm. I think. Translates as Andrew White. White, yeah. White Bailey. It, it's a pseudonym anyway. I don't remember what the guy's real name is. but oh, it's, oh, anyway, St. Petersburg. I think I have another copy that's just called Petersburg. This is the first one I read. I read it twice, and I, I, I liked this version better than the one I by a, a, a more recent translator. Mm. You know? And this is interesting because it's on Nabokov's list of the four best books of the 20th century mm. he didn't even include any of his own which That's I was generous him. Of him. <laughs> Ulysses uh, Remembrance of Things Past mm. the Metamorphosis mm -hmm. of Kafka and St. Petersburg mm -hmm. and well, I do hold the book up in pretty high regard so yeah I read another book by the same author that more, much more recently um, Silver Dove I don't know if I told you about it at all, but that was that was really cool. Like it, every once in a while, I'll start thinking about that book for no reason because it was very involving with me. I don't know why. I liked I liked it a lot. That's interesting. I'll have to look into that one. Yeah, yeah for me, these two. Now, this is funny because this gets into Finn territory. One of them I actually probably would read, and the other one, I'll be honest, I probably wouldn't. But like I said, it was pretty. So this one, I, I could see myself reading at some point. Oh, yeah. And I think that's a book club. There, there's a club, like, yes. starts with an H or something. Yeah, this is the... Heritage? No. Let me see. They're just calling it a collector's edition by the Eastern Press. Huh, Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. But anyway, that, yeah, this is the way of all. Yeah, that's flesh. a very fancy binding. Yeah. Yeah. That's this the is, one you might read. I might read this. Yeah, I could see myself reading this. The way of all flesh by Samuel Butler, and it yeah, just yeah. feels super nice. And I was also really pleased. I got this for two dollars at a just. A, I think it was like a charity thing of some type. Yeah. And I, I thought I think they put it with the Bible because I don't think they read what it was. I think they just thought, oh, fancy book. It must be a Bible. Yeah. Yeah. And it yeah. kind of could be, I guess. Yeah, anyway, yeah. I get to find. <laughs> I thought that was really funny, but I think that's, that's why it was only two dollars. Those are really, those are really cool looking. Yeah, I agree. yeah, and then this one is just really pretty as an object, but not about a subject I have any interest in. But I saw it, and I was like, oh, I can't leave it because, like, who's gonna buy this otherwise? Which is this one. Oh, okay. It's just pretty, so pretty. Yeah, it's I like, like just a on blue. It was really pretty. Yeah, yeah. but it's like I didn't catch it. Something about Zealand. What? Not even rivers and streams of England. Oh, okay. Wow. That but it really does crazy. have, yeah, but it, I mean, it does have like some nice illustrations okay. of yeah, yeah, yeah. rivers and streams, but it's mostly just text about them. Okay. I haven't investigated it too closely, but I just saw that at the Salvation Army and I was like, oh God, I just know this is going to end up in their wood chipper pile because who's going to yeah. buy this? Yeah, um, yeah. So and I put it in the really attractive looking, very, very nice cover. Beautiful. And hey, if I ever this is one of those ones where if I ever met somebody who I thought they would genuinely read and enjoy this, I would gift it to them because mm -hmm. I would rather have it be in the hands of somebody who'd actually read it rather than just mm -hmm. me because I didn't want it to be thrown away. But like right. oh yeah, no, I that, that makes sense to me. It this that reminds me of uh, because that was such an odd topic. Mm -hmm. Here's a book. And again, there's nothing that special about the book physically, but it's just really interesting. Oh, I do like the this. Material world, a global family portrait. 
and it shows people with with like whatever they own is all brought out of their house mm -hmm. and set up in the in front of the house to show what kinds of things are are typical in a given mm -hmm. um country like that should be done again. oh here's the united states anyway it's it's just full of these weird pictures that like there's a family standing to be photographed amid the stuff out of their house like mm -hmm. we're going to take the bookcase out and put it on the driveway and you know and everything and as you look through it you 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 think about the, well, like the cover tries to show you a contrast this is yeah. not too well that's the united states people mm -hmm. and here's somebody else mm -hmm. completely different kinds of stuff i wonder if it wouldn't look very different if that were done again now I think that would be interesting. That's a good question. I'm curious. Yeah. Uh, anyway, South Africa, and you know, it's just it's really fascinating mm -hmm. and you know, a little disheartening. Just thinking, wow, that's all those people have, you know, like one goat, two chairs. You know, it's like yeah, a food. You know, it's like well, oh. it makes you wonder though. I mean, going back to the consumerism of it all. Before we get back to the consumerism of it all, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it does make you think though, like. Because I remember watching, this is a very brief aside, but like one of the um, shows that mom and I liked watching a lot, I don't know if she still watches it, was Obsessive Compulsive Cleaners. And mm -hmm. specifically what I remember, like the ethics of that show could be, that's a whole other thing. But like there was this the contrast because that was in Great Britain. And they were basically like, if I'm oversimplifying, they would go and clean out hoarded houses in Britain. But then they did a season where it was like a crossover where the cleaners were flown out to the United States. And I just remember like the statistics that they read off at the beginning of the episode where they went and did that, where it was like Americans have like typically have like X more amount of space because they have houses instead of like a townhouse or an apartment. And therefore they have X amount more stuff. And then they like showed like the, and it was yeah, just so yeah. funny because I was like, Oh my God, we're, yeah. we don't need all that, but it's like anyway. like mat mat materialism obesity. <laughs> it is a materialism obesity, but if it's books, it's okay. That's different. <laughs> I yeah. remember there was some story about a guy who had some ridiculous number of books in his apartment, and he wound up dying because a bookcase fell on top of him. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a classic thing. Oh my god! No, it couldn't be me. In, in um in auto da fe, uh -huh. really cool. the main one of the main characters, the main guy is named uh, Peter Keen, K -I -E -N, mm -hmm. and, I think, and he's a he's a sinologist uh, uh -huh. in Chinese, and he has bookcases that you know that he's 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 kind of loony like he, they're all his friends and stuff like that you know and he marries his housekeeper she kind mm -hmm. of tricks him into it and then she takes over his life and it's really bizarre but but he has a big book collection and you know I think that's, that's what it does you know I think there's a I think Thomas Jefferson wrote a book about his library. Oh, really? It was about a huge library. And yeah. the famous um, Walter Benjamin, who's like a literary critic and philosopher, mm -hmm. has an essay on unpacking his library after a move and just talking about his books, you know. like That's just, actually really cool. I might check that out. That sounds up my street because like I, mm -hmm. Hendrick can attest to this, but sometimes if I'm just like stressed out or even if I'm not and I just like, I don't know something comes over me and before I go to bed sometimes I'll just come this is so weird but like I'll just come in here into my office because this is like my like super curated bookshelf versus like yeah. the other ones that are I, I I do a good job I organize them but like this one I don't know it's just like in my office and I'll just right. come and sit on the floor and I'll just kind of like touch the spines and like make sure everything's in a line and kind of run my hands over all the books and maybe pull one out and put it back in and I it's just like it just feels nice yeah I do I really do yeah oh yeah no I I feel very I think there's a weird sense of security it's sort of like yeah if we were in sort of some sort of lockdown yeah I have plenty to do for the rest of my mm -hmm. life I mean, with not that we would ever be in any kind of lockdown. That would never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, maybe a plague of some kind. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, that's funny because that was one of the books I had. Ah, the plague. Okay. Is not a full time. Did you read that? It's it's the next thing on my TBR for because oh. I think our book club is going to read this. Okay, good because what I would like you to do for me is find out. You, do you remember Throw Mama from the Train? It was a movie. 
No. With um, Gene Wilder. It's it's a, a spoof on a Sherlock Holmes, a spoof on an Alfred Hitchcock movie mm. where where a loony guy convinces this other he, he tells this other guy, hey, if you kill the person I want to kill, I want dead, and I kill the person you want dead, there'd be no way <laughs> to figure out who did it because neither of us have a motive. Okay. That killing, you know? Uh-huh. So, guy, so in the Hitchcock movie, the other guy goes, That's ridiculous, you numb you numbskull. I'm not gonna get involved in that. Then the other guy goes ahead and kills the one that makes this other, the, the, the look the guilty life better yeah. and then expects the other guy to uh, do his part. You know what I mean? Uh, when throw, you know, throw Mama from the Train, they did a, a parody of that, a funny version of that. The only reason I bring the whole thing up is that Gene Wilder was supposedly trying to write a book. Uh, and he was stuck on the first line, you know, which is pretty pathetic. So yeah. Was, the night was hot and the night was hot and can't think of it. I can't think of it. So he that comes up every once in a while throughout the movie. And then finally, mm-hmm. this woman who who's everybody's trying to kill just yells at him like "sultry, you idiot, sultry." <laughs> you know? So he, he maybe he would supply a word, but it wasn't the one he wanted. If uh-huh. it was sultry, he was looking for. But she's just uh-huh. like like strangling him. <laughs> anyway, the, the relevance of that to the plague is. There's a writer in that book who's struggling with his first sentence. Okay. He's supposedly writing a novel. And I can never, I told somebody at work about this, but I can't find that happening. I, I've kind of skimmed through the book and I kept trying to find it. I even looked online to make sure I was remembering that right. Huh. And I'm, all, I'm quite sure it's that book. Okay. Well, when I get through it, I will pay attention for a writer struggling to come up with their first line. And it isn't like a throwaway thing. He's a fairly major character. I mean, he he winds in and out of the people that are meeting each other. They, they wind up in a in a lockdown, as you know, as this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was okay. why we were going to read it because it was obviously well not quite as topical, but like. Yeah. But like uh, still something where it was like, oh, that would be kind of interesting. But I just love this cover. Look at that. I think that the simplicity of it, I was so glad there's no other words on it. It's just the yeah. cover yeah. image yeah. and the title. Yeah. I just think it's yeah. stunning. Very interesting. Very interesting cover. And the other one that I have like that, that's the last one I had on my stack. But also uh, these are all paperbacks. I guess that I just have a lot of paperbacks. But this one is also one of my favorite covers of any of the books I have. I just think it's so stunning. For the Invisible Man. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And again, no other words on the cover. It's just the title, very small, right. and this yes, image. Yes. Yeah, I like the I like the image. That's so cool. so cool. This one's from yeah Bantam, okay. which I like usually. And this one's from not Bantam. Vintage. <laughs> Vintage. Yeah, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I know that. I know that they. Oh, have, that it literally says it there too. And you um, have a final one for me. Yeah, I was. I kind of took up a lot of your time with my rant about those movies. That's uh, fine. Let's see. Oh yeah, here's this is kind of weird. Mm. I don't know if I mentioned this the other day. I couldn't find it at the time. It's called Anything Can Happen. Oh yes, you were talking about this, but you got and it at like a sixth grade. Not be my original copy, although it looks. I think it was just like this. Uh, let me see. This one. This was published. I'm curious uh, if it's said in here. Hmm. 1945 is the newest publication date. I mean, 40, 42, 43, 44, mm-hmm. 45 uh, copyrights. Anyway, I was in sixth grade and I went to a used book sale of some kind and I picked this up and read it. And it's always stuck with me. It's just like it's a immigrant story. It's like, the well, the character is, the, the author was born in Georgia, Russia, uh, it says I, I don't I don't even remember anything about it, but I, I just thought I might get around to rereading that just to mm. see what would have been going into my sixth grade brain from this book that I that I remembered it all these years later yeah. without even you know I just remember the guy was an immigrant character mm. and he wanders around and has a lot of experiences. Well, so anyway. I will say I, something that I noticed from even just that little back and forth of showing off our books, and this might be kind of an interesting place to end things because. I, I think it's very interesting that we have all these very similar opinions about why we like our physical book collections. And yet when we're talking about let's collect books that we think are, you know, stunning, that we took it in such different directions. Cause for me, that's a very literal thing. 
where it's like, I like the picture on this cover. I think the design of the spine is really lovely or something. And for you, you even said it's like, it's the sentimental, it's the sentimentality of the book itself. It's not so much necessarily what it looks like for you when you pulled those choices. It was like the memory attached to the book, which I find very fascinating that that was the beauty of those books to you. Like the dictionary, I think that's so cool. I guess it is is like, I, I can't think of another example or another analogy, but it, but it, you know something that reminds you of 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 having read the book. Yeah. You know, like so either the copy you read, mm. which may you know may have just been whatever was available at the time, you know, which is true of this anything can happen book. Mm. I mean, if this copy is from 1945. That predates you. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's just I, yeah, it's just funny, it's just interesting. Yeah, I, I, I guess you're right. I, I certainly do enjoy looking at a cool looking book. My friend at work, uh, Peter, is often I'm walking by his desk or something, and he'll go check this out, and he'll show me the cover of a book that he really likes because he's into art more, you know, than mm -hmm. I am. Maybe. And I'll just go, yeah, that's really really cool, or you know. But it's similar to your observation about the plague, the cover of the book, yeah. or the Invisible Man, of. Um, in those cases, you're probably going to be interested in the contents also, but you might see a book. I guess, you know, the only, you can't judge a book by the cover kind of a thing. I guess I, my instinct is if I pick up a book and go, oh, I don't know anything about this. I, I often look to see if there are any blurbs by people I trust mm -hmm. or, you know, what's the what's the nature of the story or, or anecdotal things like Nabokov saying this is one of the four you know, best books of the 20th mm -hmm. century. Mm -hmm. so that might be worth my time because I think Nabokov is no idiot. Yeah. You, know, you could start reading it and go, I have no interest in this. Sorry, Nabokov, I don't agree with you. Or you could go, wow, that was a lucky find or a lucky, you know. So I am kind of led to the books often by external advisors, mm -hmm. but I certainly keep my own thoughts open to whether I agree or not, you know, and I'm not just saying... Well, you know, it must be good. I read it, but it must be good because of what he said. Mm. It's like, no, it turns out that was a good piece of advice. It's a very intriguing book. Yeah. No, I, I, a very good discussion as always. I think we, I, I like the peaks and valleys of the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's always a, a real pleasure for sure. I think that was really fun. And I, I never get tired of talking about books. So. No, it's, it's cool. Well, I get, I don't know if you had anything in mind for another time or you want to. Yeah. Oh, you did already? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I put a lot of effort and thought into this. Scene. All right. So that brings us to the end of this bit of insight. And uh, we'll go off and discuss what's going to be next time. But yeah, thank you for getting to the end of our peaks and valleys of rambling about books. <laughs> and I hope it was insightful. Yes. Uh, this is Don over and out. <laughs> Ran over and out. Bye-bye.